Hello, and welcome to Eric McElroy's American Exchange. I'm Eric McElroy, and this is my American Exchange. Um, welcome back to those of you who've listened to the podcast before. We have been on a little bit of a break. Um, that was partly enforced by the fact that I unexpectedly had to move after our last podcast in March, and then the summer happened, and life happened, and so here we are. And where are we exactly? Well, and if you're just joining us, the idea of this podcast is that I'm an American based here in London, and I've been trying to spend a little bit of time, as I still care about what happens to my home country since it affects pretty much everything, connecting with people back in the States to find out what the fuck is going on. Um, or if you don't like me swearing, what the heck is going on? But I've already sworn, so it's a little bit late for that. Um, but... Uh, we're back, and we're going to be doing um, a number of pods, of course, up into the run-up of the election on November 5th, which is just a few weeks away. Eight, nine weeks? It's very, very close, peoples. Um, and it's getting quite intense. And it's changed a lot since the last conversation that I had with you in March. Um, anybody heard of Kamala Harris? Um, apparently, nobody even heard her last name was Harris, if you listen to Donald Trump. Um, but apparently, uh, she's running for president. If, I mean, if you haven't been paying attention to any of the news since my last podcast in March, I mean, good. This is the only thing that you should listen to, but maybe you should check out some other news outlets as well. Uh, but to find out what's happening, we're, so we're post the Democratic Convention, we're post the Republican Convention, we've got our two candidates for now until something else changes. And after Labor Day, which is the 2nd of September in America, the presidential election is going to go into higher gear than it's already been. This is when people start to tune in. This is when the normal Americans that aren't geeks like me, and maybe you, and if you're a political geek, this is this is it. This is where we belong, um, is going to really pay attention to what is happening and the battle for the American democracy, which I know sounds like hyperbole, but, you know, that's what it is. We are at an inflection point where we've got one person who's running for office, who's the current vice president of the United States, a former senator, a former district attorney of her state, and the other guy is a felon and has been found liable for sexual assault, amongst other things, like being impeached twice. So there's quite a contest to be had. Um, we started off with this first podcast back with Kimberly Johnson, who's been on the pod before. Um, she's the author of two fantastic books called, one's called Peyton's Choice, the other is The Virgin Diaries. She's the host of her own podcast, which is amazing, called Start Me Up. And she is also a democratic activist. So I wanted to talk to somebody, because I often have talked to people um, if pre in previous podcasts who were Republicans, but are now standing up against Trump. And that's, we're going to have some of those guests coming up soon. But I wanted to talk to somebody who's on the Democratic side, who's been fighting the fight, who is someone who, you know, likes to kind of uh, make her voice heard and let her views be known, which is good. She's not shy, which I think is fantastic because Democrats need to be engaged. Democrats need to stand from the rooftops and shout what their policies are, what we believe, and to get into the fight. Now, that doesn't mean we fight in an unethical way, but Republicans, if you've listened to my conversations with Rick um, uh, Wilson from the, uh, yes, that's right, uh, from Lincoln Project, uh, you know, they like to get dirty. They're willing to go there and push hard. And Democrats need to do the same thing. And Kimberly is one of those Democratic voices. So it's great to have her on the podcast. We talked about how she feels about the change from Biden to Harris. Uh, she was one of those people who, like me, felt uncomfortable with doing the switch, partly because we both listened to Alan Lichman and his 13 Keys to the White House, which we'll be talking about more throughout the podcast. And if you haven't checked him out, he's somebody who's really good to listen to. He successfully predicted every presidential race since 1980-something, with the exception of the Al Gore thing, which, you know, you can debate about what happened there. But otherwise, uh, he's predicted all the elections successfully, including Trump, including Biden. Um, one of the things that I did ask Kimberly about are who are some people that she trusts to listen to? And we went through those names. I'll mention those again at the end of the podcast as well. But we talked about the strategy of Kamala doing press, not doing press. We talked about the fact that Trump is struggling with this gear shift of a new opponent and the other things that are coming up and the vibe of what's happened after the Democratic Convention. So Kimberly is a fantastic conversation, and I think you'll enjoy this as well. So please enjoy Kimberly Johnson. Kimberly, it's great to welcome you back on the podcast. Um, I've been on a little bit of a hiatus, and this is the first podcast I'm doing back since it is now a race between Kamala Harris and yeah. Donald J. Trump. How are you feeling? And is this what you wanted? Are you happy? 
Because remember, I'm um, dialing in from London. I don't know. Right. Where, I'm only watching everything from afar. Right. I don't know what's really going on. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on again. It's awesome to be with you. Yeah. Great <laughs> um, to have how you. am I feeling? Okay. So let me just back up and say <laughs> when, when everybody was coming out against Biden, I was very angry because mm. I didn't like, I mean, I was kind of under the impression Biden could still win. Um, I don't know if that, I don't, you know, obviously you didn't see the internal polling, but there's a friend of mine, Christopher Boozy, who has been accurately predicting elections. And it's not just him. There was also, I don't remember the man's name, but he's a, a presidential historian and he's been accurate in predicting the last 13. Alan Lichman. Alan Lichman. Thank you. I'm a um, big fan so of his. Yeah. Yes, me too. And so, you know, he was saying that basically because by, there was 13 points of why uh, Biden was going to win. So anyway, I was terrified of you know, a brokered convention. I was terrified of open primaries. Mm. Democrats have a tendency to screw things up. So <laughs> I did not want that to happen. And I also, okay, let me also back all the way up to when he did that debate in June. Mm. I could not even watch it. I freaked out. I, you know, it was within the first five minutes when he, <laughs> when he lost his train of thought, I ran into the other room and I just watched YouTube videos while my boyfriend was out in the living room watching it. And I was devastated. I did realize afterward that, you know, everything he said, he, he was filled with substance. He just, the optics were terrible. He was not yeah. feeling well. He was extremely tired. And yes, he's very old. Mm. Um, but if you just looked at the transcripts of what he said, yeah. he made sense. He knew what he was talking about. The man is old, but he's savvy. So mm -hmm. I was fiercely defending him. And so, you know, it was very upsetting to me to see whether it was movie stars or certain democratic leaders or, you know, whoever it was calling for him to step down, the pressure was mounting and it was really pissing me off. It was making me so angry. I think I told everybody to fuck off like multiple times um, and I meant it and I'm still yeah. angry at George Clooney. And the thing is <laughs> now, okay, now that it happened, I know this is a long answer, but it's like, now that yeah. it happened, um, I really feel like obviously this was a very good decision. I mm. hate, the way it was handled. I hate yeah. it. And, you know, I was afraid like everybody else after that debate, it's like, oh no, what, what Biden are we going to get? Are we going to get, you know, the kick-ass uh, dark Brandon or are we, and that's what we call him. And then, or are mm. we, you know, we're going to get the guy from the debate who yeah. it would freak me out. So I, you know, once I'm going to hurry up, I'm going to hurry up with this, but like, you know, on June 21st or I'm sorry, July 21st, I believe that was Sunday. Um, yeah. that he stepped down and it made me feel sick to my stomach when it first happened. And I called my mom. She felt sick to her stomach. We were both really upset and it was just amazing because I like to call this, like we had a collective quantum jump, right? Mm -hmm. Where one moment things look one way and we all kind of collectively feel this one way, but we were yeah. watching, you know, I, th I think it took them like 27 minutes to endorse Kamala. Mm -hmm. Once that happened, we saw this alignment with the Democratic Party, this unification, this unbelievable, um, I don't, it was just everything kind of fell into place. So it's like, you know, I mean, like if you win the lottery, that's kind of like a quantum jump, right? You're in yeah. one situation in one minute, and then all of a sudden you're in a new one. That's how it felt to me. It's like all of a sudden there was hope, there was light, there was happiness, there was joy. And then she picked, and this was my first pick, she picked Tim Walls. And that was mm. the that was the best po possible pick. So- you ask me how I'm feeling. I'm feeling very hopeful. So you had heard of Tim Walls because no one had ever well, heard of Tim Walls. No, except I maybe mean, Minnesota. I had, right. I had heard of him because of David Hogg, who was, who is a, um, I think, I can't remember. He was a victim of a school shooting. He wasn't hit. He was Park, Parkland friend, shooting. Parkland. I think. Yeah. Yes. So, he, you know, he's a huge advocate and activist and he's mm. a Gen Zer, I believe. And he started talking about Tim Walls. And mm. that's where I was first. I mean, it was right after he was, you know, named one of the top contenders for VP. So yeah. I, you know, I took a look at everybody. And the, then Tim Walls came up with the weird moniker, which, okay, mm. other people have referred to Donald Trump as weird. Yeah. And the, and the, and mega. But for whatever reason, it stuck when Tim said it. Yeah. And then it's become this kind of, it's, it's been working. It's been like mm -hmm. mocking them. 
and making fun of them and calling them weird. It's driving them crazy. It's working. They're trying to turn it around on us now. That's why we know it's working. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I think he was the perfect pick. He, you know, I don't know for, for all the people over, I, I don't know if everybody over there gets um, Ted Lasso. Do you guys watch Ted Lasso over there? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it's based, I mean, it's based, it's based it's three based miles from England. where I live. Yeah. I okay. Mean, well, there, I live, well, I mean, yeah. yeah. So I feel like, I'm not kidding. I feel like Americans manifested kind of the Ted Lasso situation because you've got mm. Rebecca, right? The strong woman and that's Kamala. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and then you've got this coach who is just all heart and all love and all American. He's a good mm. man. And he's also a representative of what true masculine, we hear a lot about masculinity and toxic masculinity. And yeah. I mean, in my, you know, just to be real quick, toxic masculinity is more about the idea that men aren't allowed to cry, that men have to like sports, that men have to be a certain way with women. And that's a yeah. toxic version of what really it, masculinity is. And and mm. I, I think you look at Tim Walls and he's the picture of it. Yeah. Of masculinity. I, it does. I mean, it is, I've seen a couple of commentators talk about the fact that this idea that you have to contrast this strong, uh, powerful mixed race woman with someone who's going to make other people feel quote unquote safe because he's a yeah. safe pair of hands. But at the same time, it is a, he is a, a folksy balance. She is a she mm -hmm. is a California liberal. Whether we're, if you yeah. set aside the fact that you know the issues in American politics, which you know these things are identity politics are real in every country, but if you set aside that she's a big city lawyer, that kind of thing, he brings a folksy charm. And you know mm -hmm. Trump did it. He brought you know Trump is a you know is is a is a uh, is a liar and a fraud and an adulterer. So he brought in Mike Pence. You know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can see it's done on both sides of the fence. Um, I would yes. like to think that Kamala Harris will try not to kill Tim Walls. I don't, I don't think she will. You don't think she will? Although he's, he's no, he's um, also not interested in becoming president. So, yeah. you know, let's just say, you know, we, we she, she wins, which she have to win. She wins. Mm -hmm. And then let's say she's president for eight years. I don't think he's going to run. I just, I yeah. don't think he's interested in that. And I think... He's I, I, I trust him that if mm. something were to happen to her, I trust his judgment, because also when you're a president, you're not just going by yourself. You've got so many advisors. Yeah. And if you take a look at the decisions that he's made on his own, um, I just trust him. I trust that he'll get good advice. I trust that he'll make good decisions if something were to come up. But I think what he's there for is to basically prop her up and do the job of a good vice president. And I think that's really all he wants. And. Mm. I don't think she's going to come. I think I think they really kind of like you said, yes, she's a big city liberal and yeah. he's kind of the folksy white man, middle America. Mm. But I think they're both representing the best of both of those labels. So, yeah. you know, they're they're joyful. They're happy. You know, we see this we see this image of Kamala, who is the strong woman who takes no crap, who's able to make uh, Supreme Court justice candidates cry when they're lying on stage. And <laughs> he's so good at what she does. But then there's this other side to her that's just a mm. regular woman who's an auntie and a stepmom and a, you know, a cook and, and somebody who is a loving family member. And yeah. the same thing, you know, you got Tim Walls where he's he is this folksy guy. And but on the other hand, he's made some really strong decisions. And when I say strong, I mean progressive dis decisions. I think there was an article that came out yesterday about how uh, young LGBT youth felt comfortable to go to him. It gave them mm. a safe when he place was a, to go. When he was a teacher yes. and uh, yes. a high school teacher for a yes. long time and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I think she's, because a lot of people in the States, so some of the people in the States I connect with, I've got, I've got both sides in my family. I've got the Trump supporters and I've got the I've got the liberal supporters and I've got everything, but a lot of them, the vibe I was getting before she became the candidate was that Kamala's, you know, not doing anything, which vice presidents aren't supposed to be seen to be doing anything. That's their job. Yeah. And she seems to have done a good job of sort of cocooning for the last three years and has just come out as this political butterfly. If that's, you know, not in a well sexist way of saying butterfly, I would say, you know, she's just like a shell that she's come out of that people didn't seem to be expecting from any angle but that must have been burbling along well it was i mean she was going and talking she was talking to college students and she was mm. out there talking to people and i think if you look at kamala in 2020 and you look at her now she's really tightened up as a speaker mm. not that she was bad i mean she was a prosecutor she's always been an ace but i think the yeah. more you do it you know they say like 10 
10,000 hours of anything makes you an expert or whatever. So it's like, Mm. she's had all these hours now of going out. And on top of it, she's been talking to college students and and not only college students, because she has been working with Biden on legislation and all of that. But, um, and she's gone to the border and she's gone and done a lot of things. But the thing is, is that the president, vice presidents in particular aren't even covered by the press. So we don't Mm. get to see what it, it, it gives the illusion. She's in a cocoon, but I don't think she really, I mean, she was to the degree where we didn't see her. But I yeah. mean, she she's been working and doing things kind of behind the scenes. And so now that this is all happening, I mean, I would like to go back to that debate in 2020 when she called out Joe Biden um, mm-hmm. for the it was the buffing thing, you know, back when she was a little girl and yeah. it was a racist thing that was going on. She called him out. And it was funny because there was this woman whenever I go to the grocery store. I always talk to everybody. I always, you know, tell people to vote. And so there's this one particular woman, she and I like to call her my friend because we just Mm. got along so well. She was a Democrat. She was a black woman and she did not like Kamala. Mm. And so while this was all going on, you know, she was, she was kind of like, I don't like her. I don't like her. And I I was like, I like her. I mean, my first choice was always Elizabeth Warren back in 2020. But of course I I came to Joe Biden and, and I'm grateful for him. And I think he's, been literally the best president of my lifetime. So that said, um, after, you know, everything was done and they were in office, she brought it up again, how she didn't like Kamala. And I said, why don't you like her? And she says, well, I don't like the way she attacked Biden. And I said, but Mm. you know what? She didn't attack him. She confronted him with something that was extremely important to her and other people in this country, other black people specifically. And what did he do? He listened to her. And then he made her the vice president. And it was like, when I said that, she kind of was like, oh my God, I didn't even think about it that way. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I said that this, you know, she, it, it takes balls to confront people, especially mm-hmm. on a national stage. And especially when you're a woman and a woman of color. And she, I think she's remarkable. I, I gen, I mean, I always liked her and I would vacillate mm-hmm. between Kamala and uh, Elizabeth during the 2020 primary. Yeah. I love Elizabeth Warren, though, so much. I love her <laughs> because of all her progressive legislation. But I am so excited about Kamala. I think she's going, I, I, I genuinely believe she is the perfect person for this moment. And part of that reason is just because of the way that everybody's reacting. We've got Reagan yeah. Republicans supporting her now. Yeah, I think today there was a Bush general that just one of the Bush generals um, has just said that he thinks that she's the one that needs to lead the country because Donald Trump obviously yeah. can't. Um, right. Mm-hmm. I, the pivot that Trump has gone through to try and react to her. I have one, I've only seen one other person say this. So I want to say it uh, here um, for posterity's sake, because only one other person, but I think the reason uh, Trump has struggled to deal with Kamala and the change, and he seems obsessed with the fact that Biden was running and Biden has left. And that's really right. suddenly, <laughs> see, he's surprised that, uh, you know, I mean, and it, but not just, it's not surprising that Trump is not handling it well because he's Trump, but that his campaign right. wasn't prepared for the fact that the 80 year old man they were running against might stumble. Um, yeah. But I think the reason Trump cannot fathom what's happened and he's struggling is A, he can never imagine doing something so selfless that Joe Biden has done. Yeah. And B, he is deep down terrified that the party will rise up and throw him out as well. Mm-hmm. So I think he you just it's fear based. And that's why he's stuck still on starting most of his speeches, which I will watch because um, I, <laughs> I, I, I can't because that's I, I'm unwell, obviously. But um, <laughs> but he starts by attacking Biden and then starts talking yeah. about the woman he's actually running against. So that's I think that's why he struggled. I, I'm, but I'm curious to say or here, what, 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 what do you think? Because he seems to be struggling. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, simply he is a rapist and a convict and she's a prosecutor and he knows mm. that. And he's, he's seen her go, ag- I mean, anybody who has not watched her go against Brett Kavanaugh when he yeah. was uh, being considered for the Supreme Court, go watch that. That's mm. mind blowing. She's so good. And, and same with Bill Barr. Going up against these people in these hearings and, and, and when they're, you know, vetting people, she is bad ass and she's really smart. And now he's chickening out of the debate. She, uh, he, you know, he's terrified because look, if he chooses to debate, we all know what's going to happen. He's Hmm. going to bombard her with lies Yeah. because it's, it's a, you know, I mean, I don't think Trump is all mentally there, but I think he's mentally there enough to know certain things not to say certain things about Putin, not, you know, 
I think he understands that it's got to be that fire hose of, of, of lies because yeah. you can't keep up. If you tell 35 lies in 15 minutes, the person you're debating can't get to every lie. So, mm. and take the time to, deb- to debunk it. So number one, we are going to experience, you know, if he decides to debate, but I think Kamala knows this. And mm-hmm. I'd really like to say VP Harris, but I think her, her first name is so beautiful and, and I love saying it. <laughs> it's like, but I, I don't want to take away from, you know, her, where she has been able to, you know, what she's been able to achieve. But so I'll say VP Harris right now, but then I'll just call her Kamala because I just. Because my but, daughter picked <laughs> up on that just to pick up on the name thing briefly. Um, so my daughter's voting for the first time in this election in the U.S. So I'm very Yay. excited about that. Yeah. Um, although the state hasn't gotten her properly registered yet, so I'm still battling with that. I won't name. I won't na- sh- shame them, but um, we're getting there. <laughs> she will vote in this. Um, yeah. She picked up on the fact that we were calling her by her first name, and she's like, "Why yeah. are you doing that? She, she yeah. should be, co- you know, by Harris." Or and I've noticed a few yeah. other people picking up on that thread that it's it is a thing done because Hillary was Hillary, and yeah. Um, but I think it's just the, well. There was depends. Bernie. Like, we we do it yeah. all the time. We did it Jeb with Bernie. Was Jeb? And, I mean, yeah. I think I some think he said Biden the... because Joe is too common. Yeah. So you know, if you have a name that I think you know, I often like to I call him Donald because evidently he hates it according to Mary Trump. So I'm going to call him right. Donald as much as I can. But sometimes I call him Trump. Always but, I mean, listen to Kamala, Mary Trump. Yeah. Always. <laughs> but I think I think Kamala is such a beautiful name, and it's yeah. it's unique and it's different, and. You know, I don't want to diminish, like I said, uh, her title and what mm. she's been able to achieve. So, but I, I'm going to refer to her as Kamala. But I think, you know, going back to what you said, I think that um, Donald Trump is, first of all, she's running to save democracy. He's mm. running to stay out of jail. Yeah. And so, you know, he's viewing her. She's a prosecutor. She's successful. She's really good at what she does. She's incredibly intelligent. And on top of it, She's beautiful. And I mean, he can't get past that because he keeps, and he's like, I'm better looking than Kamala. I mean, he's just, he's insane. He's yeah. losing his mind. And so it's, in a way, it's, it's, it's fun to see this happen. But on the other hand, it's dangerous. And we don't yeah. know where this is going. And now he's pairing up with, uh, you know, the weirdest man in the world, Robert Kennedy, RFK. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that's going to go. I don't yeah. see, because I just want to say, you know, I'm skipping over to this, but um, I know that there are people who are fearful and with good reason, right? Fearful mm-hmm. of the third party spoiler types. But at, at this particular, I mean, this is what worries me about RFK to a degree is mm-hmm. that he's not, um, he's not dropping out of the race completely. He's only yeah. removing his name from battleground states so that he can remain in the states that are red and blue. And yeah. possibly hurt Kamala. Yeah. Um, by staying out of those battleground states, he's guaranteeing that votes won't go to him to be taken away from Trump. Yeah. More people align, I'd say more people align with, more Trump supporters align with RFK than than Kamala supporters would align with him. Yeah. I don't believe most of the third party, uh, you know, contrarian voters mm-hmm. were going to vote for Democrats in the first place, yeah. just because they have left leaning ideas or, you know, they're called leftists. And sometimes they're so far left that they go to the right, which is like Tulsi Gabbard, right? She starts yeah. out as a Democrat. And so I don't know that those people would have voted blue anyway. I don't know. But I do think that there is some threat. I just think it's minimal when it comes to RFK. Yeah, I mean, so I think weird. the voters that are going to follow RFK are the people that eat roadkill on a exactly. regular basis, which I didn't know was, a, I only heard about eating roadkill about two years ago when somebody's <laughs> like, well, as long as you don't kill it yourself, you can eat it. That's apparently the law in England. I don't know what the law is uh, on the East Coast. Yeah, of the I don't United know States. the law. I don't. So you're not allowed roadkill. to, if you hit the animal, that's your gift right. to the current person in the car behind you. Wow. But if you see it hit, then bear for dinner which obviously is what wow. he was going to have um, <laughs> well and then there's the whole thing with his daughter talking about how he cut a head off of a whale carcass and strapped it that strapped it to the top of his car and she said in the article that they had to wear plastic bags over their head with holes in their mouth to breathe because whale juice would like oh. hit them i don't know if it was accelerating or stopping 
And she said it was, it smelled so awful. So yeah. And now they're investigating it. There's a literal investigation into this. I mean, remember when Mitt Romney <laughs> had his dog on the, the hood of his yes, car and that was I the do. most controversial thing that, uh, right. Yeah. But I mean, the serious side of RFK, I, I think, because I've seen, he's only appeared once at uh, the one speech with Trump where Trump, you know, accepted his endorsement, but the round of applause that RFK got was so big and Trump even commented on it and said, I haven't seen anyone I've introduced get that big of a round of applause. I think if Trump appear, if he appears with Trump again, and if RFK gets a big round of applause again, they will never be seen together. <laughs> Probably. You're right. Too so, much for the big ego to handle. Yeah. He can't handle anyone upstaging him. So that's why J.D. Mm -hmm. Vance is perfect because he's flopped. Mm -hmm. Pence was perfect because he was barely alive in the first place. Yeah. So I think that we're, I think right now, yes, that we're still less than a week from the endorsement of RFK, but I don't see him lasting much longer as somebody that Trump wants to even talk about. That's yeah, and I, I, I could I could see that. Although I did, say, I think, you know, on my phone in an article or something like that, that just, I, I swiped by really quick, something about adding him to, I don't know if it was the campaign or something, but I think the he's going to be team. added. Transition team, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know where that's all going to go, but I think, I think that, Kamala's momentum is so huge. I, here's here's my message. Number one, to all the people in the United States who are voting, or mm. you know, especially if you're abroad, to a check your registration. Check your yeah. registration every single, not every day before the election, but as you are heading up to the election, make sure that when you do vote, whether it's by mail or in person, that you're registered. And then continue mm. to check after you've done it. Just check it all the time. But the most important thing here is this is providing she wins and i think mm. she's got a good chance as long as we all show up yeah. she's going to i mean if we can remember back to obama and how everything went with him in 2014 the american people did not give him uh, a, a a blue senate and a blue congress he lost yeah. it all that's our fault there there were things that were done there were suppression tactics and all of that that came into yeah. play but literally had the lowest voter turnout for Democrats in 80 years. That's all mm -hmm. on us. And so what winds up happening is if we don't give her, I mean, I, and we've got to do it for the entire presidency. If we yeah. don't give her the power of the Senate and the House to back her up, she's not going to get things passed. And the Republicans yeah. are going, the, the Republicans will make sure she doesn't pass anything. And then they'll blame her for not passing anything. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's the message that's going to go out and there's going to be liberal people or they're going to be people who are not not junkies like me just kind of on the periphery paying attention and they're going to be like she didn't do anything because they're yeah. not they don't really know how things work so we have to give her that majority and then on top of it we've got to vote blue all the way down the line i know that it's kind of tedious to go through i talked about this last night on a fundraiser i did but you know we get those democratic pamphlets and it shows you who everybody, you know, all your choices. Yeah. I just recommend whether you spread it out over the period of days or you just dedicate an hour or two hours of your time to really do your research and vote blue city council, school boards, because yeah. there's a David Pepper wrote a book called Saving Democracy. And it talks about the importance of state houses. Mm -hmm. If we can flip state houses, that's that has to do with abortion. That has to do with yeah. all these issues that we're giving all the president all the power and she only has so much power. So, mm. you know, individual states that right now are allowing women to have abortions, it's because of their state legislature. So we have to vote all blue down the ballot. So thank you for letting me say that because it's just <laughs> so important. <laughs> no, I think, well, I think the proof positive is what happened in 2022 when midterm yeah. elections normally go against the house in power, which was Biden's house, you know, Biden in power. And we, kept the Senate and did better in the Senate and then barely almost got yeah. back the house or kept barely right. kept the house. So, which is not supposed to happen. It was big. the last time we talked was right after the alleged red wave. And we were, we were talking, mm -hmm. that was the last time we, we connected um, here. And, um, and that was because people were invigorated by what had happened with Roe v. Wade, which was a direct result of people in 2014 not giving Barack Obama the Senate because Mitch McConnell was able to steal the Senate seat from him. Yep. So that's that's the that's what happens. And so until we have a majority in the Senate and have a majority in the House, you're right, she won't get things done. And you know, uh, in the in the Supreme Court, as you know, I'm sure Clarence Thomas is 76 years old. 
uh, Sotomayor. Yeah, that's I didn't the other realize thing, yeah. she's in her seventies and she has diabetes, which I didn't realize. Uh, um, right. You know, uh, Alito is seventy something years old. So there's going to be seats up for grabs in the Supreme yeah. Court, which just gave the presidential uh, presidential immunity to any president, which is yeah. As a whole well, I want to just say yeah. with the immunity thing, what they decided was it's case by case basis. So yeah. that means. They're going to look at Trump and go, sure, you have immunity for this, but Biden does not have immunity. So they're going to pick yeah. and choose who gets immunity. So just saying. <laughs> but yeah, the <laughs> Supreme is totally Court is fair. another reason. Yeah, yeah, I know. Right. So fair. <laughs> the, I think, I mean, but yeah, the vote, vote, vote is all about, you know, because I mean, thank you posted about vote from abroad, which was brilliant mm -hmm. um, on your feed because you know, there's 2.8 million Americans overseas. And, you know, yeah. obviously, you know, I'm from a safe blue state, but um, but those swing states, that'll make all the difference if they get engaged. Definitely. Yeah. Strategy wise, things that she's doing. So obviously it seems like in general, even Fox News had to recognize that there was energy at the DNC and that mm -hmm. there's an excitement and joy and vibe. I keep seeing these words come out in the media, mm -hmm. but there's other strategic things going on. As we're recording this, we do, she still has not yet done a, a, a proper press interview with sit down with hard questions and that kind of thing with any journalist, you know, alleged left or right journalist. Now, maybe that will come out in the next day or so. There's rumors that she's going to do it. Strategy-wise, do you think that's been a good thing, a bad thing, or it's a dumb thing because they can keep banging on about it. She hasn't done an interview and then she'll do an interview and then they've got nothing to talk about anymore. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know what she's going to do. I mean, if I were her, I would obviously choose the person to interview me. I mean, I would probably choose somebody like Robert Costa, who I love mm -hmm. and adore. Um, but, you know, there are other, other people that she could choose. Um, unfortunately, our corporate media is not for democracy. They are for clicks, they're for profit, they're for entertainment. They yeah. are, and what they have done is decided that because Donald Trump is such a lost cause, he gets to do anything he wants. They don't call him out on any of his crimes. They don't call him out on anything really. And mm. then they nitpick on the Democrats. And yeah. if you take a look, unfortunately, you know, you've got the New York Times, the New York Times, CNN, um, it's a number, even MSNBC, which is just extremely upsetting to the CEOs are oligarchs who are donating to Donald Trump. So yeah. while you have on MSNBC, my very favorite journalist of all time, which is Lawrence O'Donnell, I, mm. I will always love him forever. Um, you know, it's because it, it, he's just so great. I just I love him. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I would I hope I get to meet him one day. Just I think he's the coolest guy. But you know, you've got other, I'm just not going to get into the names of it, but you've got other people out there. Well, I will get into one name, like Jake Tapper from CNN. Um, you know, he just, he never pushes back. He never just, he never talks about, okay, that's not true. He just lets mm. people lie. He sits there while they lie. And then he gets all bent out of shape because somebody, Tim Walls makes a joke about a couch at, you know, because the whole idea is that J.D. Vance had sex with a couch and we all know yeah. it's not true, but, but the Republicans are saying that Democrats kill their children when they when they don't want them anymore. When they're so, it's like, screw you. We're gonna we're gonna stay with the couch fucker joke because you know, sorry, fuck you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm so pro. Yeah, you say it wasn't it. a couch; it was a lounge chair. Maybe that's what we should be saying. <laughs> you know, right? Really, he should. But anyway, <laughs> um, I I'm starting to lose my, my where was where was I going with this? Because I'm the just corporate like babbling media. on. Oh right, so the corporate media, I think is not doing America, not just the presidency. You know, a yeah. lot of presidents or candidates don't like the media. That's nothing mm. new. It, but the way that the media is behaving right now, I, it's not so much of a punishment. It's like, no, I'm not giving you the time of day because you're, you know, I mean, the, the New York Times just came out with an article that says joy is not a strategy. Okay, hello. Mm. Let's look at Obama and uh, what was his strategy? Hope. That wasn't yeah. the only strategy, but that that was like this vibe. It was the feeling, the feeling of hope, because you've got yeah. this really talented, capable, effective leader. And that's what she is. Um, so I think that it's again, it's not a punishment, but it's like until you can get your shit together, I'm not talking to you. Or yeah. if I do talk to someone and hopefully, you know, if she does, it'll be somebody like Robert Costa. It'll be somebody who is able to, you know. If there needs to be pushback, that's fine. I'm not against anybody pushing back on a Democrat. It's just, yeah. you know, let's let's tell the truth. And they're not being honest and they're not being truthful. And you know what? The mainstream media in the United States was very upset 
because a lot of Democrats were tapped to go to the convention. A lot of independent Democratic journalists, podcasters mm. got to go to the Democratic convention. And those are the people that were reporting on what was happening. And right. it's driving regular journal- journalists nuts. But it's like too bad. Till, until you can do the job that's truly fair and balanced, then yeah. we're not going to pay. We're not paying attention to you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, well, the the way we reach people has changed. Obviously, doing this podcast, doing other things. I mean, the the way to connect. And Trump is speaking, you know, to all kinds of weird nut job podcasters and reaching his right. weird nut job audience. Um, so I, it's just it's the fact that they keep going on about it on Trump's side, and in some and some levels, you see the media, the mainstream media, picking up on it. But it's one of those things that as a strategy, she's going to do an interview and then you can't complain about it anymore. Exactly. So, and she's got, yeah. of course, she's going to have an interview. She's going to mm-hmm. talk to someone. She's going to have a press conference. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's there. I mean, are there other strategic things that you see hap- or that you want to see happening that haven't happened yet? So obviously we've got the debate well, likely to happen unless Trump pulls out. You right. know, She'll do an interview at some point. What else are you hoping to see now that we've had this, I think, successful convention? Well, I do think it would be awesome if she would do some of the independent podcasts. I don't know if she mm. will. Um, yeah. I think, and I'm not talking about mine. Mine's pretty small, but somebody like, you know, I work for Allison Gill, who is the host of the Daily Beans, mm. somebody like that, or um, just some of the bigger names out there in yeah. in liberal podcast world. I think that would benefit her because, you know, it was interesting uh, back before the 2022 midterms, I had a freak out. And I was like really worried about white supremacy. And I tagged Jamie Harrison, the head of the DNC. Mm. And I, you know, I was like, the white supremacists are winning. You have to do more. Well, I don't know what I said, but I was panicked. (laughs) And I I know he was upset by that because he felt like he was up again, you know, he was going upstream. He was fighting so much. And and Mm. at the time, Democrats didn't have as much money. And, you know, he felt as if what I said didn't help. Mm. And 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 I, I can understand why he would feel that way. And then so basically it turned into the the liberals who were paying attention to that tweet said, you know, he should go on independent podcasts. And so he said, all right, I will. So he came on mm. mine. He went oh, on brilliant. a number of different shows. And okay. so he was able to kind of talk me down. <laughs> I understood what he was doing. I understood the effort that, you know, everything that was happening. And if you look at what happened in 2022, the Democrats, like you were saying earlier, actually avoided that red wave. So I completely try. I mean, Jamie Harrison. Oh, and I'm just going to kind of toot my own horn a little bit here. And I'm not sure this had anything to do with me. But again, I think it was prior to 2022. I had this idea that back in the 80s, you know, America had like Live Aid or, Mm. you know, We Are the World. And, and they were all these artists that would come together and raise awareness and money on a particular subject. So I was hoping that the wealthy liberals, whether they were, you know, in the entertainment industry in any way or Democratic anybody's, would kind of create this, this event that would mm. appeal to young people, appeal to all, you know, very diverse audience using entertainment, using comedy and, and, and basically informing people about the threat of white supremacy and fascism. So, mm. of course, no, no one paid any attention to me. But, you know, I wrote I, I paired up with this woman, Lorraine Devon Wilkie, and we we put out like a not a press release, but like an article that was just saying, hey, anybody out there, if you're paying attention, um, Mark Cuban, whatever, any any of you people who have this money and, and have connections, maybe mm. you could just do something. So, of course, nothing happens. But I'm watching the DNC. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is exactly what I wanted. Jamie Harrison put together. So and he and I obviously he was on my podcast and maybe he, you know, maybe he saw my tweet and maybe some little seed planted in his head. Maybe not, but (laughs) I'll never know. And, you know, but it was exactly what I wanted because there was this there was this one part on the DNC where Kenan Thompson from Saturday Night Live came out. Yeah, he's so funny. He had the Project 2025 book, and he was basically informing the audience of different things that would happen under the Trump presidency in Project 2025 with humor. And, and you could walk away from it and have an understanding of, oh, if, if, if Trump wins, this will happen. So I just, you know, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know if I had anything to do with it, but I'm just grateful. The DNC just take was it. great. Yeah. <laughs> just, it's your, you just take it. You sent the tweet. He saw the tweet. Take it. Um, 
I guess as we go, so we got 70 odd days. Well, we're recording this with roughly 70 days to go. Yeah, I think about 70 days. Yeah. 70 odd days. I mean, what do you, because people always talk about the October surprise. I mean, what are the other wild card fears that you're watching out for? Um, I, I'm not overly worried. I, I will bring mm. this to say, you know, I mentioned Christopher Boozy. He's going to be on my show on, on Thursday. And okay. he has been accurately predicting elections now for at least since 2022. And then mm. all the special elections that have come after that. Other, other, there was something else that he, I think it was the convictions where he, he said, you know, I, I do believe Trump will get at least 27 convictions. He wound up getting all up in 34. Yeah. Anyway, so he's been really good and he does not use polling. He uses mm. other uh, other things to determine whether or not um, states are going to flip or whatever. So he just put out a map. He's going to do one more in October. And he feels that after, you know, after that map, that's because we're got the sugar high right now from the DNC. Yeah. And so things are going to have to fall into place. We're going to have a debate. We're going to have the sentencing, maybe, hopefully, on September 10th. So um, he'll put out that map. But right now, the map that he put out, it's got the, the electoral is for Democrats at 349. He mm-hmm. he is predicting very strong that Florida will flip so strongly that wow. he's, he's battling uh, the GOP on Twitter. It's hilarious to watch him battle because he's just he is so sarcastic, which I love. But anyway, um, they're freaking out in Florida. And so mm-hmm. Christopher Boozy has noticed this and it's kind of gone. I think they went after him and they're just having back and forths. But he, he detailed, you know, Christopher owns Spoutable. And he just mm-hmm. recently did on Sunday, it's called the pod, where it was just him. And he explained why he came to the conclusion with his map. So he talks about why he thinks Florida is going to flip. There's a number of reasons. It's, all kinds of reasons. And he had Nikki Freed, who I, I don't remember what her title is, but he, he played the video or yeah, the audio recording of her talking about why Florida is in play. And wow. um, on top of it, he said now he believes Iowa and Ohio are in play. He did not say they hmm. will flip. He just said they are in play. He also put Texas in the pink category, which is not flipping, but is yeah. becoming more to the blue. So I will say that I think I think if young people show up and vote, we all know they're on TikTok. We yeah. all know that they are are thankfully volunteering. Um, they're registering to vote. I think in this particular case, we're going to see a bigger youth turnout than we ever have. I don't know if it's going to be all of them. But if mm. we do, I think we're going to see higher than 349. I think we're going to be very surprised. Yeah. But the fear, the fear that I have um, Although I know, you know, Mark Elias, who is uh, uh, an attorney who has been very successful in, in working against, you know, these people who want the election deniers and the people who are going to refuse to certify the election. He's been mm-hmm. working very hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, but what's but what will happen is, OK, let's say in Florida, maybe Florida is going to flip, mm-hmm. but it maybe is only going to flip with 3000 votes. Yeah. Well, if that happens, it's going to be challenged. So yeah. that's the problem we're facing. We're going to, uh, you know, he's predicting North Carolina is going to go to, uh, he's also predicting Georgia is going to go um, right. to Kamala. So uh, there's going to be a few battleground states that are going to squeak by. Here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping we can get to 270 with enough blue states that are solid margins that if hmm. Florida is only 3000 more, it won't matter, it matter if they decide yeah. that it's red. So, you know, we don't know, but I'm not so much afraid of anything happening before the election. I mean, we never know. This has been a crazy election cycle. So who knows what's going to happen? But I yeah. think the real the real concern is what happens after she wins and how these you know states who are hell bent on not giving her that win. If if the win is big enough, too big to rig, they say, you know, then they can't because then what they'll do is they'll send it to the Supreme Court. And we all know what yeah. will happen if that if, if they do that. Yeah. So that's Supreme my Court fear. Doesn't seem like a fair arbiter. Um, and because no. I think the Supreme Court is going to be looking at this, that if Kamala gets in, they know they're in trouble because, yes. you know, she's going to either, well, she's going to be in a position to, if any of them leave, to replace them with liberals or to put in place the reforms that Biden and her have yes. sub- uh, proposed to bring expand. ethics to the yeah. Supreme Court. Yeah, um, and possibly be- expand it. Yeah, or to expand it altogether. So I, I, I don't think courts need ethics. I think that that's just silly. I mean, you know. 
<laughs> they're, they're good men and Silly women. Ethics. <laughs> the ethics, schmethics. I mean, you know, if you had a billionaire friend, <laughs> come on. If you've got a billionaire friend who's going to buy you some, uh, buy a house for your mother and buy a few flights, who's going to not take that? <laughs> right. Who's going to declare that? <laughs> oh, man. It's it's so insane. Um, well, that was one of the things actually I was going to ask you about it. Who are some of the people that are, give a decent commentary that you're listening to? And you just did that. You just listed them all out there. Um, and the other thing I was going to ask you about was uh, was kind of a call to action. But you've kind of done that by talking about the voting already. And I listened um, to the, the latest episode of your podcast with your mom, which I thought was oh. brilliant. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> not all of us would have our moms on our podcasts. And I love my mom, but I'm sorry, mom, you're not coming on, you're not coming on the pod. <laughs> um, but that was one of the things that she was talking about and you were talking about is just getting engaged in voting, which is, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the fundamental thing that you can do in what right. remains, at least for now is democracy. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, again, if there's any, anything extra, you know, mm. whether it's writing out postcards, making phone calls, I'm going to be making phone calls, um, yeah. whether it's knocking on doors, I, I happen to live in a blue state, so I'm not going to go knocking on doors, especially where I live, because it's so diverse here. It's pretty blue. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to be sending postcards. I'm sorry. I'm going to be doing phone calls and, right. you know, I've done some fundraisers online. So everybody just doing one little extra thing. So you vote, right? Just count that, but then yep. do one extra thing. And I'm going to also recommend, even though I'm an author and I have my own books, I, I I'm going to recommend the book saving democracy by mm. David Pepper, by anybody who's listening in America here, because he, he has such great ideas on how to get involved, not just right now, hmm. but like once um, this election is over, one of the things that people can do is go to their, you know, library and mm -hmm. ask or, or, or if there's some kind of a, a bigger venue, ask if you can set up a voter registration because that's bipartisan, right, or nonpartisan. And it's just a way to make voting easier for everybody. So if you have it in your local library, there's all these different things. And, and that's what David gives lots of really practical advice to where if you're the kind of person that doesn't feel comfortable knocking on a door or making a phone call or whatever, um, yeah. you can, or even at your, at your place of business, if you work at some kind of a, not so much of a mall, but you know, a, a bigger kind of a venue that maybe there can be a place where people can just stop and register to vote. That was one idea he had, but there's all these mm. other things. And it's like, you can, depending on your personality, because we're not all, you know, feeling comfortable going out and speaking and talking and, you know, some of us are introverts and all that. So there's things introverts can do. There's things people who are, <laughs> don't want to deal with other people that you, you can do that. Just yeah. do one extra thing. And don't forget to just be so consistent with checking your registration because Republicans are right now panicking and they are going to do every single thing they can to cheat and push people off the rolls and do what they can. So you have to be prepared for that. And yeah. oh, the last thing I'm gonna say is, make sure you know when you sign your um, registration or when you sign your ballot, that mm -hmm. it matches what you signed with your registration. Because I, when I registered to vote, this was back in California, but there was one year I voted thankfully early and I got a thing back from the registrar of voters saying your signatures don't match because yeah. I, have a quick, I have a quick little signature and then I spell out my name signature. So yeah. I, I did not do that. So I had to go and, yeah. and do that again. So just make sure your signatures match. <laughs> I know it's because, well, because you never write anything anymore. So like, I know, I, you know, I, I, just, know. <laughs> I, I don't even, I barely know what my signature is. And then my daughter, um, again, she's voting for the first time and she's never, she doesn't, you know, kids don't sign things. So she's, right. and she's very creative and she's an artist. So she's like, I haven't decided what my signature is going to be. So she's sitting there. <laughs> I got her to, you know, fill out the voter, um, form to you know to register and she's practicing a signature i'm like all right we're gonna have to take pictures of this because there's no way <laughs> know, you're gonna know. go with a new vibe for your signature in two months right. and your right. energy is gonna change and you're gonna be like you want to de-emphasize the m in mackleboy right. i'm like oh fuck just just do it quick just do it quick that's how you she's like i don't i don't want it like that that's not the right vibe i'm like oh <laughs> Oh, youth. So, youth is Gen Z. I mean, they will save us if they don't destroy us first. Exactly. Um, let's be fair. They're not the ones. Um, well, thank you. That that was, br was brilliant to catch up. And we'll make sure that yeah. um, your podcast and details, of course, are in all the bios and stuff for this. But it's nice. to. Thank you seem like you have an optimistic view at this stage, which is nice. I do. To I'm very optimistic. Yes. Yes. Good. I like that because we're bringing the joy. 
Yeah, it's all about the joy. So, <laughs> great to talk to you again, though, Kimberly. Thanks so much. Yes. Thank you for having me on. There we go. That was Kimberly Johnson, author, podcaster, Democrat. Uh, it was brilliant to talk to her again. Brilliant to hear her ideas. I think we're coming at things very similarly, um, which isn't necessarily bad. It's nice to talk to people who get your worldview. You know, the fact that I wasn't necessarily screaming to get rid of Biden. Some of my future guests coming up were some of those advocates that wanted to get rid of Biden the minute he stepped onto that debate stage last time. Um, I think we've the transition to Kamala has gone so well. That's taken away a lot of the concerns I had in dumping Biden. Um, but we didn't dump Biden. Biden stepped forward and said, I don't think I can do this. Whether, well, did he say that? He didn't say it that way, but Biden's basically admitted that the wins weren't there, especially after Nancy Pelosi pointed out those wins. Uh, some of the people, uh, just again to say that who Kimberly recommended listening to, so Alan Lichman is one I advocate that you check out. Um, she mentioned Christopher Boozy, Simon Rosenberg, uh, Tom Bonier, Bo Bonier, uh, Allison Gill. Those are people that you should definitely check out, listen to, and uh, also are voices of reason where there's a lot of noise and other things to listen to, other than, of course, Kimberly's podcast and this podcast right here. So welcome back. We'll be back again next week. Make sure that you um, give the pod a like or a, a heart or whatever platform you're on. Subscribe to us if you're listening on um, the podcast platform that you're on. We're going to be on YouTube as well. So do the likes and subscribes and stuff there also. We'll be back again next week. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you again to Kimberly for coming back on the podcast. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.